Hello, and welcome to the course, What is Machine Learning? This is Chapter 1, Introduction and Course Resources. There are three broad areas of machine learning. First, there's supervised machine learning. Informally, this involves learning a function that fits the data, then using it for prediction. Applications include predicting house prices, spam filtering, image classification, and language translation. Next, there's unsupervised machine learning. Informally, this involves learning patterns in data. Applications include finding clusters, data mining, and anomaly detection. Finally, there's reinforcement learning. Informally, this involves learning strategies to maximize reward. Applications include game playing, such as tic-tac-toe, checkers, chess, and go, and industrial control. So let's start with a supervised learning example. Here we're going to use linear regression for house price prediction. Here's the data, and each blue dot here corresponds to a house. The x-axis is house area, and the y-axis is house price. In linear regression, we start off with a guess for the straight line that fits the data, and then use the linear regression algorithm to find better and better fits to the data, as shown in this movie. Okay, so you can see we're getting a better fit to the data, and once the movie is completed, the algorithm is completed, then when a new house comes in, if we know the area, we can then go up to the straight line to predict the house price. Okay, so now let's look at an unsupervised learning example. Here, we're trying to find clusters and customer data using the k-means algorithm. Here's the data, and again, the blue dots correspond to the data, and each individual dot corresponds to a customer. X-axis is relative salary, Y-axis is relative number of purchases. In the k-means algorithm, we try to find clusters. We specify the number of clusters we're looking for, and also specify the initial starting points for the cluster means, or the cluster centers. So these are our guesses for the cluster centers. And if we run the movie, we can see the k-means algorithm in action. It finds better and better estimates for the cluster centers and also determines the points associated with each cluster center. So this is the green cluster center and associated points, the black cluster center and associated points, and the red cluster center and associated points. Finally, let's look at an example for reinforcement learning. Here, the goal is to find a strategy to go through a maze as quickly as possible using the Q-learning algorithm. So here's a maze, and the idea is to go from start to end as quickly as possible. In each square, one can go up, down, left, or right. And if you hit a wall, you come back to the same position. Initially, we're going to assume that each of the four actions is equally likely. And the Q-learning algorithm takes many uh, trips through the maze called episodes and collects information which it ultimately uses to determine the optimal strategy. So if we run this uh, movie, you can see the Q-learning algorithm in action, and it quickly determines the optimal strategy to go through the maze as quickly as possible. So you have to go across, up, across, and down here in the final channel. And in any of these squares, one can go either to the right or down, and both are optimal. So what is in this course? This short course contains a mostly non-technical overview of machine learning algorithms and the problems they're used to solve, with examples using pictures, plots, and animations, demos of machine learning code in Python, a list of resources for further study of machine learning. Okay, so here's the course outline. This is chapter one, an introduction and uh, listing of course resources. Chapter two covers supervised machine learning. Chapter three covers unsupervised machine learning. Chapter four covers reinforcement learning. Chapter five is a demo of Python codes. And chapter six has con concluding remarks and a list of useful resources. Okay, so the course resources are located at the, the following GitHub site. And this is the landing page for that GitHub site. So if we get out of PowerPoint here, we can go to that GitHub site. So this is the GitHub site. And if you click on the code button here, you can download a zip file of the resources to your machine. Okay, I've already done that and unzipped the file. So there's a code folder, presentations folder, and resources folder. If I click on code, then there's a data folder for with, which has data that we use for the examples in this uh, course, and then individual folders for the three types of machine learning. So if you go to the supervised example, here you're going to see Python programs and Python notebooks, which um, have the examples um, that we're going to present in this course. 
So coming back to the top level, presentations has PDF versions of the PowerPoint presentations for the six chapters in this course. And finally, resources has a file that has a lot of resources, useful resources and links um, for machine learning. So if I come to that file, it has a bunch of links to Wikipedia pages and other uh, resources online organized by chapter. So introduction, supervised learning, and so on. Okay. So that ends this introductory chapter. I hope that you will enjoy, enjoy this course and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? This is chapter two, Supervised Machine Learning. Let's start with a definition, and this is adapted from the Wikipedia page on supervised learning. Supervised learning is the task of learning a function that maps an input to an output based on an example input-output pairs. The learned function is used to predict outputs for new input values. Here's an informal definition. Learn a function that maps inputs to outputs based on given data. Use the function to make predictions. Okay, so let's see this in action. Let's start with house price prediction using linear re regression. So here's the problem. Find a straight line to fit house price data. So along the x-axis, we have house area, and along the y-axis, we have house price. Each dot corresponds to a house, and there are 500 data points in this data set. Okay, the goal is to find a straight line that best fits this data. So let's review the linear regression solution approach. Start with the data. For each data point, input x is the house area, and output y is the house price. For the function mapping inputs to outputs, we're going to assume a linear function, y equals w times x plus b. And our goal is to find the best slope w and intercept b. To do this, we introduce something called the loss function. And the loss measures the goodness of fit of the linear function by comparing actual y values to those predicted by the linear function. Typically, we use something called the mean squared error function for linear regression. The next is the learning phase, and it's also called training or fitting in machine learning literature. We use an optimization algorithm to find W and B that minimize the loss function for the training data. So the supposition is that by minimizing the loss function, finding the best W and B to minimize the loss function, we're getting a, a good fit to the data. Okay. And finally, there's the prediction phase. We use the learn W and B and the function to predict house prices if a new house area data is provided. So let's see this in action. So we have our house price data that we saw previously and a machine learning prediction. So this is the initial machine learning prediction. And um, let's run this movie. So you can see that we're getting better and better predictions. And underneath this is an optimization taking place. Um, the optimization routine is trying to find the slope and intercept to minimize the loss function. And if we look at the loss function, here's the loss function over 100 iterations. Each iteration is an improvement to the fit of the function. So we started with an initial guess and made 100 improvements. And you can see the loss function has decreased significantly. Okay. In the prediction phase, if a new house comes in, we have the house area. We can go up to the line to predict the house price. Okay, so let's generalize this. And here's the general approach for supervised learning. Let's start with the data. Typically, the input is a vector x. So that means instead of just one entry, we have many entries uh, or features. And the output is y, a single value. And the function, we're going to assume a general form of the function for mapping training data input to output. And the general form has many parameters analogous to the slope and intercept. So for linear regression, we had two parameters. In general, you might have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of parameters. Okay. We introduce a loss function, and it measures the goodness of fit of our function. Um, and then in the learning or training phase, we use an optimization algorithm to find the parameter values that minimize the loss function for the training data. We, make, we use an iterative approach. We make an initial guess and then improve. So remember, by uh, minimizing the loss function, the supposition is that we're getting a better and better fit to the data. Finally, there's the prediction phase. We use the learned parameters and our function to predict output for new x values. Let's see this in action for binary classification. So the input 
is two features, x0 and x1 coordinates, and the output is a label 0 or 1. So if we look at this picture here, we have the dots, which are the uh, training data uh, value uh, points. Each dot corresponds to a single data point. The x um, values are the x0 and x1 coordinates, the two coordinates for the point, and the output y is 0 or 1. The blue dots correspond to 1, the red dots correspond to 0. Okay. And the goal is to find a function that best fits the data. So this is our initial guess for the function. The yellow region is where the function is 1. The purple region is where the function is 0. And if we run this, we see um, the, the machine learning algorithm in action. We're getting a better and better fit to the data. And remember, underneath this, an optimization is taking place to minimize the loss function. So let's look at the loss function. In this example, we did 100 iterations. So we had an initial guess and 100 improvements to the um, parameters to find the best fit to the data. And you can see the loss function has decreased significantly. And you can see here in this picture that we have a reasonable um, comparison to the original data. The purple region is where the function we have looked for is zero, and that corresponds well to the data points where y equals zero. And the yellow region is where the function is one, and that corresponds well to the blue dots where y is one. Okay. We can do this for multi-class classification. Again, we have dots in the x0, x1 plane. So the input uh, for each data point is the x0 and x1 coordinates. And the output is a label 0, 1, 2, or 3. So red uh, dots correspond to points where uh, y equals 0, blue y equals 1, green y equals 2, cyan is where y equals 3. And the goal is to find a function that fits this data. Okay. And this is our initial guess for the function. Purple is where uh, the, the function is 0. Blue is where the function is 1. Green is where the function is 2. And yellow is where the function is 3. So if we run the movie, we can see we're getting a better and better fit. We made our initial guess, and we're improving that initial guess. And in the end, after 100 um, improvements or iterations, we get a reasonable fit to the original um, training data. And again, if we look at the loss function, we see the progression from about 2.6 or so, and the, the loss function decreases to around 0.2 after 100 iterations. Okay. So we've looked at some dots in the plane. Let's look at a more realistic example. Um, this is the MNIST digits classification problem. And there are thousands of handwritten digit images with 28 by 28 resolution. So here's a, a site for the data source. And these are samples of the digits. So these are the first 25 digits in the data set. Each digit is 28 by 28, or each image is 28 by 28 resolution. And you can see that they're not uniform. So this is an example of a 1. This is an example of a 1. This is an example of a 1. Here's a 5, and here's a 5. So what are we trying to do here? The goal is to find a function that maps these images into the digit labels. The digit labels are 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. And our goal is to find that function and then use it for prediction. OK. So x for each image is a vector of 784. That's 28 by 28 pixel intensities. And y is the digit label, 0, 1, 2, 3, or um, for all the way up to nine, so one of those digit labels. We're going to use 6,000 images in the data set, and the function mapping inputs to outputs to fit the data has more than 100,000 parameters. So we're not dealing with just two, the slope and intercept. We have a very complicated function with 100,000 parameters in it. Okay, so this is an example of the loss function. You can see it started above 25 and decreases nice and steadily to around two or so. And this is a movie showing um, the image number, the actual digit label, and the predicted label. And we'll see that the predicted equals the actual in most of the cases. I think there are one or two where they're different. Okay. So it goes for 25 images. Um, so there's, it's different. 
um, but you can see that we're getting good predictions and they're matching the actual values. Okay, um, I want to talk briefly about neural networks. This is an example of a three layer neural network and let's explain what's going on here. So what is a neural network? It's a way for defining complex functions to map inputs to outputs. X is input at layer zero and an estimate for Y is output at the final layer. So this is layer zero. Information in this neural network flows from left to right and we input X here and we get an estimate for Y at the end here in the final output layer. And the layers are connected by matrix multiplications and activation functions. So that's beyond the scope of this course, but if you go and study neural networks further, you will learn that these arrows involve matrix multiplications and also um, something called activation functions. For regression or binary classification, the output layer has one unit. If we have multi-class classification, the output layer has multiple units. So um, the number of units for multi-class classification will equal the number of classes in the problem. So for the MNIST digits problem, there should be 10 units in this um, final output layer. Okay. In terms of the input layer, the number of um, units in the input layer is equal to the um, number of entries in X. So for the MNIST digits classification problem, the number of units in this input layer will be 784 because X has 784 entries. Okay, so let's talk about some applications. First, there's house price prediction, and this is a regression type problem. And the input um, is the features of the house. So we, in the example we saw earlier, we just had one feature, the house area, but you can imagine that there are dozens of features of a house, and such as lot size, house area, number of rooms, size of garage, and so on. The output in this case would be the house price. For a spam filter, that's a binary classification problem. The inputs are text or email messages and the output is a label, spam or not spam. For image classification, it could be binary or multi-class classification. The input is the image and specifically the pixel intensities. And the output is a label for each image. And then for language translation, it's a multi-class classification problem. The input maybe English words and the output, uh, their French translations, for example. Okay. In terms of some notes, um, for the data, in natural language processing, there are various approaches for converting words, sentences, documents into numbers. So that's beyond the scope of this course, uh, but you can look, look that up. For image classification, we've already talked about this, we use pixel intensities. And we also use something called image augmentation to expand the data set. So you can um, sort of stretch images, uh, rotate images, or flip Im images. So for example, if you're trying to build a system to identify cats and dogs from images, then um, if we have an image of a cat, if we flip that image, it'll still be a cat. So we can double the size of the data set just by flipping the images. You know, a flipped image of a dog is still a dog. Okay, so that technique is used in image uh, classification. In terms of the function, functions can be built uh, using neural networks. For natural language processing, there's things called recurrent neural, neural networks and other specialized structures. For image classification, there are convolutional neural networks and other specialized structures. Alternatively, you don't have to use a neural network. There are other ways of uh, defining the function. There's decision trees, random forest, and boost. For the loss function, um, for regression problems, Typically, one uses a mean squared error. For binary classification, there's something called binary cross-entropy loss. And for multi-class classification, there's cross-entropy loss. And in terms of learning, there are various approaches for minimizing the loss function. There's gradient descent, there's Adam, and there are other um, optimization routines. It turns out that the optimization routine may not converge to a minimum, or you might get blow up, or you may converge to a local minimum. So there's still some work um, being done on optimization and sort of how you choose an optimization routine involves lots of trial and error. Okay, so that ends this section on supervised learning. In the next section, we're gonna move on to unsupervised learning. So thanks, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello.
and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? This is Chapter 3, Unsupervised Machine Learning. Here is a defini definition from the Wikipedia page on unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is a type of machine lear learning that looks for previously undetected patterns in a data set with no pre-existing labels and with a minimum of human supervision. The informal definition is learn patterns in data. Okay, so what is the data? Typically, a data point is a vector x with d features. In the case of customer segmentation, x re represents customer information. Each entry is a feature of the customer, such as age, gender, salary, number of purchases, and so on. In the case of image classification, x represents an image. For black and white, each entry is the grayscale intensity for a pixel. For color, entries are the red, blue, and green intensities for each pixel. In the case of natural language processing, X may represent a document. As an example, if we have a large dictionary, such as Word 1, Word 2, Word 3, many words, each entry, entry J of X is the number of times Word J appears in the document. So this is one way to convert a document into numbers. Note that in all of these examples, the output Y used in supervised learning is not used in unsupervised learning. Okay, so there's no label or output Y in unsupervised learning. So let's talk about the clustering problem. So given data points, the goal is to find clusters in the data. And as an example, let's look at customer data. So here is the data set and each individual a blue dot is a data point corresponding to a customer. The x-axis is relative salary and the y-axis is relative number of purchases. The goal is to find clusters in the data, something similar to this. And we'll talk about the algorithm that was used to determine these clusters as we go through this chapter. But this is what clustering means. So what are the types of clustering? You can look at the Wikipedia page on cluster analysis for more details, but there are several uh, areas of or types of clustering. First, there's connectivity-based clustering. Here, one combines nearby points to create clusters or nearby clusters to create larger clusters. There's centroid-based. Here, one estimates the centroid or the mean of clusters. Um, there's distribution-based. Here, one defines clusters in terms of statistical distributions. And then there's density-based. One defines a set of points to be in a cluster if the density of data points exceeds the specified threshold. Okay, so let's start with hierarchical clustering. And this is a connectivity-based approach, creating clusters at all levels. Here's the algorithm. Assume n data points and define each as a cluster. Then we compute the distances between each of the clusters and combine the two clusters with the shortest distance between them into a single cluster. And we repeat step two until all data points are in a single cluster. So let's start with an example. Here we have five data points, the blue dots. And in the first step, we define each as a cluster. So the red circle around each corresponds to the cluster. Okay. In the first step, we look at all the pairwise distances between the points, and we can see that the distance between C and E clusters seems to be the shortest. So we combine C and E into a single cluster. Okay. Now we, um, again, compute the pairwise distances between um, the clusters. And based on this example, we can see that A and B seem to be the clusters that are closest together. So we can combine those. Again, we compute um, pairwise distances between the clusters, and we can see that the clusters A, B, and D seem to have the shortest distance between them. We combine those. And finally, now we're left with two clusters, and we can combine them into one single cluster. Okay, so this is what it means to have clusters at all levels. We can look at this in terms of a tree. We have um, a single node at the top, a single cluster with all the uh, data points. At the next level, we have the two clusters, A, B, D, and C, E, then the three clusters, the four clusters, and then at the bottom, we have the clusters corresponding to the individual data points. Okay. Another clustering algorithm is the k-means algorithm, and this is a centroid-based approach, or uh, mean, appro means, mean uh, approach, or centers approach. So we'll talk about this. First, we specify the number of clusters. And then we make an initial guess for the center or the mean of each cluster. For each cluster mean, we find the points that are closer to it than to other cluster means. 
And then based on the points assigned to each cluster, we recompute the cluster means and go back to three. So we continue with three and four until the change in the cluster means is sufficiently small. Okay. You can measure the goodness of the clustering by tracking an objective function, which is the sum of the square distance to the nearest mean. And this is like a loss function that we saw previously. Let's look at an example. We're going to start with data and an initial guess for the cluster means. And then the movie shows the computation of cluster means um, using the k-means algorithm. Okay, so the blue points are the data, and then the squares are, are guesses for the cluster means, uh, or initial guesses. So we're going to specify in this example three clusters, and we made these guesses for the centers of those clusters. If we run this movie, we can see the evolution of the cluster centers, and also you can see the points associated with each cluster center. Once completed, we have convergence here. So this is the uh, ev eventual uh, point for the green cluster center and the associated points. This is the black cluster center and associated points. And this is the red cluster center and associated points. Okay. If we look at the objective function, we can see that um, there's a significant decrease and then it levels off uh, when we get convergence. Okay. Let's also talk about principal component analysis. Machine learning problems may deal with data in the thousands of dimensions or even uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dimensions. More dimensions generally mean slower computation. PCA is a way of reducing the dimensions by retaining information in directions of most relevant principal components or keeping information in the most relevant dimensions. Typically, we choose the number of principal components to capture a specified amount of variance. Okay, let's look at an example. We have four data points in two dimensions. Since the, since the data points in all directions, both dimensions are relevant. So looking at these four data points, it's difficult to see how we can reduce the number of data dimensions from two to one, say. Contrast this with this picture. Again, we have four data points in two dimensions, but now the data points nearly align with the black line. They're not exactly on the black line, but they're nearly aligned with it. In this case, one can project the data onto the black line and reduce to one dimension. So we project these data points onto this black line. We're going to lose a little bit of information, but the hope is that with this projection, we're reducing the number of dimensions, but hopefully keeping enough of the relevant information. Okay. Here's a summary of the PCA algorithm. We start with a data matrix with number of features times the number of samples. And then we compute something called the singular value decomposition of the data matrix minus the mean. Okay, so let's not worry about the singular value decomposition now. Um, this is a, an approach from linear algebra. The variance is the sum of the squares of the singular values. So singular value decomposition computes something called singular values, and they're ordered in descending order from largest to smallest. So we're going to choose the first n singular values so that the partial variance captures the specified percentage. We then compute the reduced x minus x mean using the first n components. So this is where we do the dimension reduction. And then we add back x mean. Okay. So let's look at the PCA for the MNIST data set that we looked at previously. So we're going to apply PCA to the MNIST data set with the 6,000 images. The data matrix has 784 entries for each sample. So remember, we have each image is a 28 by 28 um, resolution um, image. So there are 784 pixels in each image. So here is a table summarizing um, the impact of PCA. So if we request that 100% of the variance be captured, then we need all 784 um, components or dimensions. If we want only 99.9% .9 of the variance to be captured, we can get away with 476 uh, dimensions or components. And for 99%, it's 323, and for 90%, it's 84. So you can see um, you can get a significant reduction in the number of dimensions. Okay. So what is the practical um, implication of this? We've seen this picture before. These are the original 25, the first 25 images from the data set. And this plot shows 
uh, again, these first 25 images keeping only 99% of the variance. So we've reconstructed these images using only the 323 uh, principal components. And you can see that there's a good matching between this reconstructed version and the original version of the images. The only sort of key difference I see is that there's a bit of shading in the back. Here in the background, it's white, um, corresponding to zero pixel intensity. Here it's slightly shaded, which suggests the pixel intensity in the background is slightly different from zero. Okay. So um, what are some applications of unsupervised learning? First, we've talked about customer segmentation. The data here would consist of customer features and behaviors. And the idea is to find clusters in customer data to create customized marketing campaigns for customer clusters with similar features. Next, there's image segmentation and the data are images. And we can use this to segment a set of unlabeled images into clusters based on how close the images are to each other. Finally, there's anomaly detection. Here, the data consists of features of a product and one performs cluster analysis and identifies anomalies as outliers. Okay. Finally, some notes. For the various um, unsupervised um, learning algorithms, one needs to do a definition of distance. So in the case of hierarchical clustering, we need to be able to define distance between clusters. For k-means clustering, we need to find distance between data points. We can use Euclidean distance, but there are, are other choices. For hierarchical clustering, it's not suitable for large amounts of data. So remember, in the hierarchical case, we're computing clusters at all levels. You can imagine if there are 10,000 or 100,000 data points, having to compute the clusters at 10,000 or 100,000 levels. So this algorithm is not suitable for a large amount of data. For the k-means, there are various issues. The user has to specify the number of uh, means k. So we have to guess or specify how many clusters we're looking for. In addition, the algorithm may find unsuitable cluster means. The estimated mean may get stuck between actual clusters. And finally, the final cluster means depend on the initial guesses. So where we end up depends on where we start with our initial guess guesses for the cluster centers. However, despite all these issues, this is a good and straightforward starting point for um, doing cluster analysis. There are other approaches we talked about briefly based on prob probability distributions and based on defining clusters in terms of um, density of data points. So you can look at the um, links in the resources file to um, get more information about other approaches. Okay, so that ends this section. and. Um, we're going to move on to the next section on reinforcement learning. So thanks, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? This is Chapter 4, Reinforcement Learning. Here is a definition from the Wikipedia page on reinforcement learning. It's the area of machine learning concerned with how software agents should take actions in an environment to maximize the cumulative reward. Here's an informal definition. Learn the strategy to maximize the cumulative reward. Okay, so let's start with the K-Bandit problem. A one-armed bandit is a nickname for a slot machine. For the K-Bandit problem, there are K slot machines, each with its own mean and then payoffs drawn from a normal distribution. If the means are not known, what strategy to follow to maximize the cumulative payoff after many pulls? Okay, so here's a, a picture of a row of slot machines. So the optimal strategy to get the greatest cumulative reward is to pull the lever for the machine with the largest mean reward. However, the agent does not know which machine has that largest mean reward, so it needs to learn. There's something called the greedy strategy. So we track the sample mean reward for each slot machine and pull the lever for the slot machine with the largest current sample mean. So let's consider an example with two slot machines. Machine one has actual mean reward equals one. Machine two has actual mean reward equals two. And this table um, summarizes a few polls. So let's go through it. Initially, all the numbers are zero and machine one has sample mean zero. Machine two has sample mean zero. So we're gonna pick one of these at random. So suppose we pick um, machine one to pull first. 
So suppose that when we pull it, the reward is one, cumulative reward is one, machine one number of pulls is one, machine one total reward is one, and machine one sample mean is one. The numbers for machine two are zero. So based on the current sample mean, these are the two current sample means. This is the larger one, so we're going to pull machine one. So suppose now the reward is minus two. The cumulative reward is a minus one after two pulls. Machine one number of pulls is two. Machine one total reward is minus one. Machine one sample mean is minus a half. No change for machine two. Okay, so now here are the sample means to compare. This is the larger one, so this time around we're gonna pull machine two. Okay, so now suppose the reward is one. The cumulative reward after three pulls is zero. No change for machine one. And for machine two, number of pulls is one. Total reward is one, um, sample mean is one. And when we compare um, sample means again, this is the larger one. So we're gonna pull machine two again. And here are some numbers for um, machine for the next pull. Okay, so you can see how, <coughs> how, the, how this goes. Um, so this leads to something called the exploit versus explore in reinforcement learning. There's an issue with the greedy approach we may get stuck pulling the lever of the machine with the lower mean value. So this leads to exploit versus explore dilemma. In exploit, at the current position, we take the action to maximize the immediate reward. For explore, at the current position, we take an action to learn about the environment. Information acquired in, ex in exploration is to be used later to hopefully increase the cumulative reward. This leads to something called the epsilon greedy strategy. For epsilon proportion of the time, we pull the lever of the slot machine at random. And then for one minus epsilon of the time, proportion of the time, we pull the lever of the slot machine with the current largest current sample mean. So this allows for pulling um, a machine at random to learn about the environment. Okay, so if we go back to the K-bandit problem, um, let's do a simulation. There are 10 slot machines and the means are drawn from a standard normal distribution. So the payoff for each slot machine is based on its mean, and then um, the payoffs are normally distributed about that mean. So the results are averaged over a thousand simulations, and we're going to compare the greedy approach, approach pure greedy, against epsilon greedy with uh, epsilon equals 0.1. So that means for epsilon greedy, it's 10% of the time we're pulling a machine at random. So here is a plot. This is the pull number along the x-axis and the proportion of pulls that the optimal bandit is chosen. So red is epsilon equals 0.1 and blue is epsilon equals zero. So for epsilon equals zero, the greedy approach, only roughly one third of the time, we're pulling the machine with the largest mean, the optimal machine. It turns out when we do some exploration, we learn about the environment, we get a better result. So here roughly about 50% of the time, for this epsilon greedy approach, we pull the machine with the largest mean uh, payoff. Okay. So here we're going to plot some uh, bar charts comparing epsilon equals zero and epsilon equals 0.1 in a movie. So let's just re let this run. And along the x-axis here, we have the bandit number from one to 10. And the they have been arranged so that the bandit or the machine with the largest mean is number 10 and the one with the smallest mean is one. So they've been arranged in order just for display purposes. And you can see again here that the optimal one when epsilon equals zero is only pulled roughly one third of the time. This is the proportion of pulls. So roughly one third of the time. In the case of epsilon equals 0.1, roughly half the time we're pulling the number 10 machine. If we pulled the number 10 machine all the time, this bar would be at one and everything else would be at zero. Okay, so what this shows is that um, doing some exploration may lead to a larger cumulative reward in the long run. Okay, so let's move on to a general formulation for reinforcement learning. So here's a picture. We start at the state and the agent is allowed to take a number of possible actions, each with a specified reward and leading to a new state where the process is repeated. Okay. So the process continues forever or until reaching a terminal state. So we start at state here. We can either take action A and collect reward A and go to new state A, or take action B 
select reward B and go to new state B and where the process is repeated. The goal is to find the optimal strategy. What is the action of each state to maximize the total cumulative reward, which may involve discounting? So I want to apply this to something called the maze problem. The state is the location in the maze. So our state is the square where we are in this maze. And the actions are up, down, left, or right. And if we hit a wall, such as this interior wall or this exterior wall, we stay in the same place. The reward is minus one for each step, including if we hit a wall. And the cumulative reward is minus one times the number of steps to go to the end. The goal is to find the strategy that maximizes the cumulative reward from start to end. So that's equivalent to minimizing the number of steps. And this is the optimal strategy. So in any of these um, squares, you can go either right or down. Here we want to go right. Here we go down along this wall and then up across and down in this channel. And if you count, you can see that there's 16 steps um, to go from start to end if we uh, um, use the optimal strategy. Okay, so how are we going to find this um, using reinforcement learning? There's an algorithm called the Q-learning um, approach. And this involves simulating episodes. So these are sequences of state action, state action pairs that go from start to end. We start with um, equal prob probability for up, down, left, or right actions at each state. And we update the action value function, which tracks the cumulative reward for each state and action pair. So we basically track information um, and use that information to help us determine the optimal strategy. So we're going to follow a greedy strategy. We're going to take the action that maximizes the cumulative reward at each step, and we're going to repeat for many episodes. And this process yields an optimal strategy obtained as a maximum of the action value function over all possible actions at each state. Okay, I know that's a lot of words there, so let's look at an example of this. So we have an animation, and this is going to show how the strategy evolves from the initial equally likely actions to optimal actions. And we show the updates after each episode. So an episode consists of a trip through the maze. And at each uh, square, we're going to take the, uh, the optimal uh, approach at that time. And initially, we assume that there's equal probability for going in any of the four directions. And as we go through the maze, we collect information and update what the optimal action should be. So if we go through here, let's stop here. At this point, after seven episodes, that means seven trips through the maze, we've collected information and identified this as the optimal strategy for each square. So clearly, we still need to do some work and collect more information. And as we collect more information, um, the optimal strategy um, is determined. Okay, so you can see we get um, right or down in any of these squares, going right and down and then up right and down in this final channel. Okay, so I wanna show a plot that has the number of moves from start to end as a function of episode. So initially, so this is the number, the episode number, and this is the number of steps from start to end. Initially, the first time we went through the maze with the equal probabilities, it took us 250 steps to go from start to end. As we went through the maze and collected information and started to determine the optimal strategy, it took fewer and fewer steps. And as we see after about 40 or so uh, episodes or trips through the maze, we've now settled down and we get 16 steps, which is the minimum number of steps to go from start to end. Okay. And you can think of this um, in relation to your own learning about doing a task. The first time you've, you did the task, it might've taken a long time, but as you gained experience, um, the amount of time to complete the task uh, would, will probably um, decrease. So it's similar in this Q-learning algorithm. So what are some applications of reinforcement learning? There's industrial control. So we might have a robot and states may be the location on a factory floor and the battery status. Actions involve include performing tasks or return to home base for charging. Rewards are positive rewards for performing the task and a negative reward for running out of power in the middle of the factory floor. So we want to choose the rewards to incentivize doing tasks and also not 
um, getting stuck um, without any power in the middle of the factory floor. Another broad area of application is game playing. Here the states are configuration of pieces on the game board. Actions are the al allowable moves. So rewards typically are a positive reward for winning the game. There may be additional intermediate rewards for other accomplish accomplishments during the play. Okay, so finally some notes. So cue learning and related algorithms, these are suitable if there are, are a reasonable number of states and actions. So the maze problems has uh, 24 states if we ignore the end, and there are four actions per state. So there are 96 action values to learn. DynaQ is, uh, is a modification of cue learning, and we can reduce the number of episodes to learn the optimal strategy by incorporating planning, um, in, as in the DynaQ algorithm. One thing to, to consider is that we have to use an alternative approach if there are many states and actions. So as an example, chess has an astronomical number of configurations of pieces on the board. And there's no way to um, go through all the uh, possible states and actions to collect information about the action value function. So we have to use an approximation method to estimate action values for state action pairs. So we use this approximation for um, state action pairs that are not visited uh, from information from state action pairs that are visited. And so we can use ideas from supervised learning. Finally, there's the Alpha Zero project. And this was an effort to create an artificial intelligence program to play chess, shogi, and go. And you can see the Alpha Zero Wikipedia page and the Alpha Go movie on YouTube. So the key thing here is that it was trained using self-play only. So for chess, it wasn't trained using games uh, played by grandmasters. And the sort of accomplishment was that it beat the other state-of-the-art programs in chess, go, and shogi. So you can learn more about um, this effort. So that ends this section. In the next section, we will do some demos of the examples in this course um, using Python codes. Okay, thanks, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to section five, demo of Python codes. The purpose of this section is to show students how to generate the examples presented in this course and experiment with Python codes. Knowledge of Python is not required and the demos will suggest input settings to investigate. So there are three options for the demo of Python codes. The first option is to run online using Google Colab. And here's a link to Google Colab, and this gives general information about um, Colab. I will provide links to the individual notebooks and show how to run them. No downloads of codes or software is required for this option. And this is the best option if you're new to Python. The only requirement here is that you, you need a Google account. Option two involves running on your local machine using Python using the Anaconda platform. So I will show how to download codes to your machine. I will show how to run notebooks using Jupyter Notebook, and we'll show how to run programs in the Anaconda prompt window. The requirement here is that you have the Anaconda platform, and you can get that from the Anaconda website. There's a free individual um, version that you can download. Okay. And then the final option is to run on your local machine. You run codes using Python on your machine without Anaconda. The requirement here is that you already have Python on your machine and that you have the NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib packages with at least these versions. So I'm going to focus mostly on number one and show how to run all the demos in Google Colab. There will be a short section on um, option two, and um, basically I'll just show you how to um, run an example notebook and run programs in the Anaconda prompt window. And if you want to do option three, I'll leave that up to you. Okay, thanks, and we'll see you in the next section. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to chapter 5.1, Demo of Linear Regression in Google Colab. You can go to the Linear Regression Notebook by one, clicking on the link in the resources tab for the section, or two, clicking on the link in chapter five of the What is ML resources PDF file, or three, clicking on the link below. So let me click on this link. 
And this takes us to the linear regression demo notebook. Okay, so a notebook consists of various cells. This is an example of a text cell. This is an example of a code cell. If you're not logged into Google, you will still be able to bring up this notebook, but you won't be able to run any of the code cells. So you can see here, I've logged into Google. Okay, so make sure you're logged in. So let's run the code cells now. So this first cell is um, needed if we're running on Google Colab and it will bring in the code from the GitHub site. So click run anyway here. Okay, it'll take a few seconds to bring the code over. You can see the things are running and when you get this check mark, that means this cell has completed running. Okay, so now we've brought the code over. Just as a note, if for some reason you've already done this before and you rerun this, you will see this message. Even though it says fatal, it's not actually fatal. All it's saying here is that what is ML already exists and is not an empty directory. That means we brought in the code from GitHub. Okay. So this cell imports the necessary libraries. And this cell has a listing of the settings you might want to play with um, when you are experimenting with this code. So seed will um, govern what random numbers are used to generate the data. End sample is the number of data points. Learning rate specifies the size of the step taken by the optimization routine when minimizing the loss function. And n iteration is the number of actual steps the optimization routine takes in trying to minimize the loss function. Okay, so as a general rule with these notebooks, you should run the um, code cells in order. So for example, if we don't run this cell, and then we run this cell, this cell sets up the uh, data, we're going to get an error here. So you can see there's an error, seed is not defined, we haven't run this cell, which defines seed and these other settings. So let's run this. And then we run setting up the data. So this generates the data. And this is the picture that we saw earlier in the course of the housing prices, area and price. Okay, so there are 500 data points as we set in the settings. So this next cell defines the model. So we're going to have a neural network. And here we specify the initial slope of minus 0.02 and initial intercept um, 1.4. Now we're gonna specify the loss function. We're gonna use mean squared error loss and something called gradient descent for um, optimization. And this is the routine that you, is used to minimize the loss function and it takes in the learning rate. So let's run this cell. This cell actually does the learning. So here, let's run this and we'll look at it. So you can see here that we take a number of steps in the optimization routine in attempting to minimize the loss function. We start off with this initial loss. And as you can see, it's decreasing. And we're taking 100 steps in total. And now the loss has decreased to 0.04. This cell here plots the loss function. And we saw a plot like this earlier on in the course. And you can see as we progress through the optimization routine, the loss decreases. And then finally, we have um, our animation of the training process. So let's run this to generate the animation. It'll take a few seconds to generate the animation. and we get this animation player. So you can click this arrow to run the animation and we'll see that we started off with an initial guess for the machine learning prediction and you can see we're getting better and better predictions of the line that fits the data. In the loop mode, this animation re keeps repeating and we can stop the animation here. If you click once, it'll just, the animation will just go through once and then stop. Reflect will um, 
allow the animation to go forward and then backward and forward and backward. So it'll keep, um, so let's stop actually again and then put it on reflect. And you can see now it's going backwards. And now we're getting back to our initial slope and intercept. And now once it hits zero, it comes back and goes forward. So reflect goes forward, backward, forward, backward. Okay, so let's, now we can stop it and uh, we can use this button to go back to the beginning. So these are standard uh, buttons you see in various players. Okay, so what settings to play with? I want to, in this demo, I want to try one thing. I want to change the learning rate to 0 0.01. The learning rate sets the size of the steps taken by the optimization routine in attempting to minimize the loss function. So we're going to take much smaller steps and let's see what the implication of that is. So again, we're going to uh, run each of these code cells in order. It's the same data as before. We're going to define the model with the same initial guess for the slope and intercept. And now we're going to specify the loss function and the optimization routine again. And now we're going to perform the learning. So. Now, after the first iteration, the loss is 0.29. And you can see here that at the final iteration, after 100 uh, steps, we're at 0.17. And here, previously, when this, the learning rate was 0.1, we went down to less than 0.05. Now let's plot the loss function with this new learning rate. Now it's at 0.17. You can see that the loss function hasn't decreased as much as in the previous run. And if we run, create the movie again, so we're creating a new movie. To give it a second to complete. And if we run this new movie, we started off with the same initial slope and intercept. And you can see now that we're taking tiny steps, so we're not making um, as good an improvement as before. And the final guess after 100 steps is not that good. So let's stop it right about here. So previously, when we took larger steps, we were getting a, a, a machine learning prediction that was a good estimate for this data. Now we're getting an estimate like this. And you can see it's not that great. And the reason is we're taking very small steps in the optimization routine in, in attempting to minimize the loss function. OK. So play around with these parameters. You can have more data points. You can try different random numbers. With a very small learning rate, you'll need to take many more iterations. So see what happens if you increase the number of iterations. Another thing to try is to try a large learning rate. And in the case of a large learning rate, you might not get a decrease in the loss function. It might actually increase. So play around with those parameters. OK, a couple of housekeeping issues. If you want to save this notebook to your Google Drive, you can go to Save a Copy in Drive. And if I do that, I save a copy. And if I want to bring up, so let's just, so this is the copy of the uh, linear regression notebook. If I want to bring that um, copy up, I can say Open Notebook, go to Google Drive, and this is the copy I just created. OK, and you can bring that up. So let's cancel this. The final thing I want to point out is that you should terminate the session. So go to Runtime, Manage Sessions, and terminate the sessions when you're done with it. So let's click Terminate. So I'm going to terminate this session. And OK, so we're done with this session. So terminate when you're finished with the session. OK, so that ends this lecture. Try playing around with these parameters and see what um, you can do with them. So thanks, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.2, Demo of Binary Classification in Google Colab.
You can go to the binary classification notebook by clicking on the link in the resources tab for this section or by clicking on the link in chapter 5 of the what is ml resources pdf file or by clicking on this link below so i'll click on this link so make sure you're logged into your google account so here's the binary classification demo notebook let's run this first cell to get the codes from the github site click run anyway so it'll take a second to get the codes. So let's import the libraries. And now let's um, look at the settings. So C controls the random numbers used to generate the data. N samples the number of data points in the data set. Case is quadratic. It could be quadratic, cubic, disk, or band. Learning rate, remember, is the size of the step taken by the optimization routine when minimizing the loss function, and n iteration is the number of steps taken by the optimization routine. So let's run this. Let's set up the data. So here's a plot of the data. We've seen this before earlier in the course. The blue dots correspond to where the labels y equals 1. Red dots are points where the label y equals 0. Here we're going to set up a neural network. It's going to have four layers in it. And that's the neural network that we're going to use to try to fit a function to the data. So here we specify the loss function and optimization routine. For binary classification, we use something called binary cross entropy. You can look that up on the internet. And we're going to use an Adam optimizer with a specified learning rate and some other parameters. Adam is a bit more sophisticated than gradient descent that we used for linear regression. So let's set that up. And now we're going to the learning phase. So let's run this. So we do the, the optimization routine is trying to minimize the loss function. Here's the value of the loss. You can see it's decreasing. I'll talk about accuracy in a second. And we take 100 steps of the optimization routine to get this loss value and this accuracy. Here's a plot of the loss function. And we saw this plot earlier in the course. Here's a plot of the results after 100 iterations. So you can see this is the prediction of the machine learning solution. The dots are the blue and the red from the training data. The yellow shaded region is where the machine learning solution predicts a value of 1. And the purple region is where the machine learning solution predicts a value of 0. And you can see there's reasonable agreement between the predictions and the original data represented by the dots. And actually, the accuracy is 98.7%. So that means that the machine learning prediction predicts the value of the label 1 or 0 98.7% of the time. OK. Finally, we have the um, training process animation. So we can run this to set up the animation and the viewer. So it'll take a few seconds to do that. OK, so this initial um, picture shows the initial prediction of the machine learning solution before any training has taken place. And now we can start the animation. And you can see that we're getting better and better predictions for the machine learning solution, better agreements with the data. OK, so it's in loop mode, so it's going to be keep, it will repeat. OK, so we can stop this. In terms of um, experiments to try with this um, demo, you can fiddle. One thing to try is to fiddle around with the learning rate and the number of iterations to see if you can improve the accuracy. The accuracy in this example was 98.7. See if you can get closer to 100% accuracy by playing around with the learning rate, say increasing the number of iterations. If we increase the number of iterations, that means more steps are taken in the by the optimizer to minimize the loss function. If you can't get closer to 100%, that would then suggest we might need a more sophisticated neural network. And changing the neural network is beyond the scope of this course, but I just wanted to let you know that typically, if you don't get the desired accuracy, you might need to change your neural network. The other things to try are play around with the number of samples, the case, and the random numbers.
Okay, so I'll let you do that. That ends this um, demo. Just remember you can save your notebook to um, Google Drive if you like. And finally, let's um, go to runtime and manage sessions and terminate this session. Okay, thanks. And that ends this lecture and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to chapter 5.3, Demo of Multi-Class Classification in Google Colab. You can go to the Multi-Class Classification Notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in chapter five of the What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on the link below. So this is the multi-class classification demo. Make sure you're logged into your Google account. Okay, so let's run the first cell to get the codes from the GitHub site. Click run anyway here. Let's import the appropriate libraries. And here's the settings cell. So C controls the random number um, used to generate the data. N samples the number of data points. Quadratic is the case, n class is the number of classes, and the number of classes can be between two and four. Um, the case can be quadratic or cubic. Learning rate is the size of the step taken by the optimization routine when minimizing the loss function, and n iteration is the number of steps taken by the optimization routine. So let's run this cell and then set up the data. So you can see we set four classes in quadratic case, and you can see that we have the quadratic shapes for these different sets of classes. And we have the four different classes here, zero, one, two, and three. You can define the model. Here is a six layer neural network for our model. And now we specify the loss function and optimization routine. We're going to use Adam just like we did for the binary classification. And now we use something called cross entropy for the loss function. Now this cell performs the learning. So we start off with a loss value of 2.5 and it decreases. And after 100 iterations, we're down to 0.1. We'll talk about the accuracy in a minute. Here's a plot of the loss function. And we saw a plot similar to this earlier in the course. And then here is a plot of the results. And the dots are the original training data and the shaded regions are the predictions of the machine learning solution. So where the shaded region is purple, that's the prediction of zero. Shaded region blue is the prediction of one. Shaded region green, prediction of two. And shaded region um, yellow, prediction of three. And this accuracy here, this represents how well the machine learning solution correctly predicts the label of the training data. So you can see the accuracy increases and after 100 um, steps or iterations of the optimization routine, we're getting accuracy of 97.5%. So the machine learning solution correctly predicts the uh, label 97.5% of the time. Okay, and then finally we have the training process animation. So let's run this. Okay. So this initial plot shows the prediction of the machine learning solution before any training has taken place. Um, so this is the initial prediction. And then when we run this movie, you can see that the uh, machine learning solution gets better and better predictions for the training data. And we know from above that the final prediction is 97.5% after so let's just put it once so it stops. 97.5% after 100 iterations. Okay, so here are some suggested experiments to try. Again, you can play around with the learning rate and number of iterations to see if you can improve the accuracy 
try to get closer to 100%. And as we discussed in the binary classification case, you might not be able to get 100%. And in that case, that suggests you might need a more sophisticated neural network. And that's beyond the scope of this course. Other things to try are the different case. Try the cubic case. Change the number of classes between two and four. Remember, two is binary classification. You might want to try three and four for the cubic and um, try those experiments. So you can save your um, file by saving a copy in the Google Drive. And then finally, let's um, terminate the session. So let's go to runtime, manage sessions, and terminate. So that ends this lecture, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.4, Demo of MNIST Digits Classification in Google Colab. You can go to the MNIST Digits, Digits Classification Notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in Chapter 5 of the What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on this link below here. So here is the notebook, multi-class classification, MNIST demo. Make sure you're logged into your Google account. So let's run the first cell here to get the codes from the GitHub site. Click Run Anyway. And now let's import the libraries. And here are the settings. So Seed controls the random numbers. N train is the number of samples in the training data set, and N valid is the number of samples in the validation data set. So I will um, describe the difference between these two as we go through this notebook. Here's the learning rate, and this is the size of the step taken by the optimization routine when minimizing the loss function, and N iteration is the number of steps taken by the optimization routine to minimize the loss function. Okay, so let's run this cell. And let's set up the data. So there are 10 classes as there are 10 digits. So here are um, 25 sample digits. 784 is the number of dimensions in the problem. Um, remember each of these digit um, images is 28 pixels by 28 pixels. That's 784 pixels total. And we have 6,000 for the training data set and 1,000 for the validation data set. Okay, so here we define the model, and we're using a very rudimentary two-layer neural network. In general, for image classification, the neural networks are much more sophisticated. There are specialized layers for um, called convolutional um, layers for image classification, and you might have neural networks with dozens of layers for image classification. Here, we're just using a very simple two-layer neural network. Okay, that defines the model. Here, we're going to specify the loss function and the optimization routine. This is the same as we used for the multi-class classification demo we saw before. Atom optimizer with a specified learning rate and some other parameters. Cross entropy um, loss function. Okay. So let's explain this output here. Um, remember for linear regression, we were trying to minimize the loss function based on two variables or two parameters, the slope and intercept of the line fitting the data. In this problem, we have many more parameters. So we have a two layer neural network and the total number of parameters is 100,000. So we're trying to, when we do the learning, we're trying to minimize a function of over 100,000 parameters. In more realistic neural networks for image classification, you might be dealing with millions or tens of millions of parameters. Okay. So now let's do the learning. And remember in the learning phase, we're trying to minimize the loss function and you can see the loss function is decreasing. This is the accuracy. And remember, accuracy represents how well the function predicted by machine learning um, correctly predicts the, the label or the digit in the image. So if we go through here, we can see that the loss function has decreased and we have 94.4% accuracy. So 
the function we have um, come up with from uh, using machine learning predicts the digit 94.4% of the time for the training data set. So here's a plot of the loss function. And here is something new. Here we're going to compute the predicted results and accuracy for the validation data set. So we have one data set that was used for training, and that's used to find the function to fit the training data. We have a completely different data set that's not used for training at all. And the idea here is to see how well the function, based on the training data, um, fits data that was not used in training. So if we run this, you can see the accuracy is 87.3%. The accuracy for the um, training data set was 94.4. Ideally, these two values should be the same. So what this is saying is that we found a function with 94.4% accuracy for the training data set, but when we used data that was not used in training, we could only get 87.3% accuracy. So these two ideally should be closer to each other. Finally, we have our animation. And this animation loops through the images and shows the actual and predicted values. So in most cases here, we will have the actual and predicted are the same. Every once in a while, they'll be different. So you can see there was a difference. This will cycle through 25 images. And we have the loop mode, so it'll repeat. Okay, so let's let it finish and then we'll stop this. Okay, so here are some suggested experiments to try. One thing you might want to do is try to improve the accuracy of training. And that may be done by um, changing the learning rate and the number of iterations and the number of training data points. You can go up to 60,000 for n train. The other thing to try is to reduce the gap between the training accuracy and the validation accuracy. And again, you might want to play around with the number of um, training and validation data sets or validation samples and the learning rate and number of iterations. So I'll let you um, try those experiments and see what you can come up with. So thanks, and um, we'll see you at the next lecture. Let's remember you can save a copy of this notebook in your Google Drive. Or And finally, let's uh, terminate this session. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.5, .5, Demo of K-Means Clustering in Google Colab. You can go to the K-Means Clustering Notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in Chapter 5 of the What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on the link below. So here is the K-Means Clustering Demo Notebook. Make sure you're signed in to your Google account. So let's run the first cell and get the codes from the GitHub site. So click Run Anyway here. So let's import the relevant li libraries. And here are the settings. So seed controls the random numbers um, used to generate the data. N samples the total number of data points. N clusters is the number of clusters that we're going to be looking for. And N iterations is the number of steps we take in the k-means algorithm. So let's run this. And let's now set up the data. So here's the data set. We're going to be looking for clusters um, within these 200 data points. OK. So we're going to create the k-means uh, model. We're going to be looking for three clusters. And now here's the learning. OK. So let's explain what's going on here. Each iteration corresponds to a step in the k-means algorithm. And in each step, we get improved guesses for the centers or means of each cluster. The Remember, underneath the k-means algorithm, there's a minimization of an objective function. So you can see that it starts off at 
3,500 and it decreases and it levels off at 393. Okay. Remember, we set the number of iterations to 20, but the code stopped at 14. And the reason the code stopped at 14 is that after 14 iterations or 14 updates to the cluster means, we got a convergence of the cluster means. So there are no more improvements or changes to the cluster means after 14 steps. So here's a plot of the objective function. So you can see that rapid decrease and then the leveling off. Here's a plot of the data and the initial cluster means. So here's the data we saw previously. The squares, the red, black, and green, are the initial cluster centers for the three clusters. And they've been chosen randomly to be close to 0, 0. And here now is the um, movie or animation of the training process. Okay. So let's run this movie. And you can see the changes in the cluster means and the points associated with each cluster mean. These points are colored in the same color as the cluster mean. Okay, let's set it to one so it stops when it's done. So you can see the evolution of the cluster means and the points associated with each cluster. And once we get convergence, this is the final estimate for the cluster. So we have the green cluster mean and green cluster, black cluster mean and black cluster, red cluster mean hidden here, and the red cluster. Okay. So you can play around with this code. And may I suggest that you change the number of samples and the change the number of clusters. You may need to change the number of iterations. You want this large enough so that it takes, the algorithm takes enough steps so that the objective function levels off. So if you don't see the lev uh, objective function leveling off, increase the number of iterations. So I'll let you experiment with this um, code. Number of clusters go up to 10. Okay, so I'll let you play with this code. Thanks, and that ends this demo. So remember, you can save this notebook in your Google Drive. And let's uh, terminate this session. So go to Runtime, Manage Sessions, and Terminate. Thanks, and, and that ends this lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.6, Demo of PCA in Google Colab. You can go to the PCA Notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in the Chapter 5 of What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on the link below. So here's the PCA Demo Notebook. Make sure you're logged into your Google account. So let's run the first cell to get the codes from the GitHub site. So click Run Anyway. Let's import the relevant libraries. And here are the settings. So Ntrain is the number of images that we're going to be looking at. And Variance Capture is the amount of variance we want to be captured in the, um, variant, in the uh, dimension reduction. OK. So Ntrain can go up to 10,000. Variance Capture between, should be greater than 0 and less than or equal to 1. So now let's set up the data. So this loads the uh, images. So we're getting 6,000 images. Remember, they're um, digit images, 28 by 28 resolution, 784 dimensions. So now let's create the model. So this takes in the amount of variance we want to capture. And now let's compute the reduced dimension version of the images. So the original dimension is 784. This is the total variance. And to capture 99% of the variance, we need only 323 dimensions. So now here's a plot of the original images. 
So here are 25 of the original images. Each image is 28 by 28 um, pixels. And now here's a plot of the reconstructed images after PCA, where we use only um, 323 dimensions. So you can see comparing the original images and the reconstructed images with a reduced number of principal components, 323, there's very little difference between these two sets of images. Okay. So in this um, demo, I suggest experimenting with a number of training data points, go up to 10,000, and with the variance capture, see how well the PCA does if we only require 90% variance capture or 75% variance capture. So play around with this variance capture uh, parameter. Okay, that ends this section or this demo. So let's um, remember you can save a copy of this notebook in your Google Drive and let's terminate this session. Click runtime, manage sessions, and terminate this session. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.7, Demo of the K-Bandit in Google Colab. You can go to the K-Bandit notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in Chapter 5 of the What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on the link below. So here's the K-Bandit demo notebook. I've logged into my Google account. So let's run the first cell to get the codes from GitHub. So click Run Anyway. Let's now import the relevant libraries. And here are the settings. So Seed governs the random numbers. N-Bandit is the number of slot machines. and Remember, when you pull a slot machine, you get a reward, and the reward is going to be normally distributed. Each machine has its own mean payoff, and the standard deviation is one. And the means are chosen uh, norm, uh, from a normal distribution. Epsilon governs the strategy. So Epsilon zero is um, a pure greedy strategy. We pull the slot machine with the largest current estimated mean payoff. For epsilon equals 0.1, 10% of the time we pull a slot machine at random. Otherwise, we use the greedy strategy. And n pull is the number of times we pull uh, the slot machine arms. Okay. So let's run this. And now let's create the model. And let's perform the simulation. So it's going to look at the two cases, epsilon equals zero and epsilon equals 0.1. And we, the reason we do the two cases is so that we can do a comparison. And now let's plot the results. So this first plot shows the pull number and the proportion of pulls that the optimal bandit has chosen. So we have 10 um, slot machines in this example, and this shows the percentage of time the slot machine with the largest mean payoff is chosen. And you can see that when epsilon equals zero, after 150 pulls, roughly one third of the time, we pull the optimal slot machine. But with epsilon equals 0.1, that increases to about half the time we pull the optimal stop slot machine. And remember, with epsilon equals 0.1, 10% of, of the time, we're pulling a, a slot machine at random. So we're doing some exploration. And by doing this exploration, we learn more about the, uh, the means, mean payoffs of the slot machines, and that helps us pull the slot machine with the largest mean payoff. Okay. So that might be a bit counterintuitive. Now let's plot the average reward. So again, we have epsilon equals zero and epsilon equals 0.1. And for epsilon equals zero, the average reward is just roughly around one. And with epsilon equals 0.1, even though we're pulling some slot machines at random and we're not using the pure greedy strategy, 
we get a higher average payoff over 150 pulls. And again, by doing some exploration, by randomly doing some pulls 10% of the time, we're learning about the, uh, the slot machines and we use that to our advantage and get a higher average payoff. And finally, we have an animation and this animation shows the bar charts. So give it a second to complete. Okay. So let's run this animation and let's explain what's going on. So I'm gonna put once here so it stops. Okay, so we have the slot machine or bandit number along the x-axis and the proportion of pulls along the y-axis. And the slot machines have been arranged in order. So the one with the lowest mean is number one and the one with the highest mean is number 10, just for visualization purposes. And you can see here, this is the epsilon equals zero case. And the optimal slot machine, one with the highest mean payoff is is pulled roughly um, a third of the time. And here, when epsilon equals 0 0.1, uh, the optimal slot machine is pulled roughly half the time. Okay, so that's a reflection of the information in this plot. And this shows more information. It shows the proportion of times all the different slot machines are pulled. The ones with the lowest mean payoff and the one with the highest mean payoff. Okay. So you can experiment with this code, and the idea is to choose different values of epsilon or different number of bandits. Let me do one experiment here. I want to increase this to one. So if we put one here, that means 100% of the time we're going to be choosing a uh, slot machine at random. So we're not going to be considering the mean payoff or learning about the mean payoff at all. We're always going to be picking a slot machine at random, and let's see what happens in this case. So let's create the model, simulate. And now let's uh, plot the results. And this makes sense. So this epsilon equals zero, we've seen this um, before. Now, when epsilon equals one, remember, we're pulling the uh, slot machines at random, independent of their mean payoffs. So you can see we pull the optimal bandit roughly 10% of the time. Since we're pulling all of the their 10 machines, we're going to pull the optimal one 10% of the time if we have a purely random strategy. In terms of the average reward, this is the same as before. And now when epsilon equals 0.1, the mean reward is roughly zero. Remember, we're choosing the, the means, mean payoff for each of the slot machines is uh, normally distributed. Or, and so if we pull them at random, we're going to get a, a mean reward of close to zero. And then for the animation, Okay, so let's let it run and let's click on once so it stops at the end. And you can see here for epsilon equals uh, one, the purely random strategy, we're pulling the each of the uh, slot machines roughly 10% of the time. And that makes sense since we have a purely random strategy. Okay, so experiment with these settings you might want to see what happens if you increase or decrease the number of bandits go between 2 and 12 and play around with the choices of epsilon you might try want to try to find the value of epsilon that gives the largest proportion of optimal pulls so i'll let you play around with that so you can save um, a copy of this notebook in your google drive and then let's go to runtime manage sessions and terminate sessions to end. Thanks, and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to Chapter 5.8, Demo of the Maze Strategy in Google Colab. 
You can go to the Maze Notebook by clicking on the link in the Resources tab for this section, or clicking on the link in Chapter 5 of the What is ML Resources PDF file, or clicking on the link below. So here's the Maze Demo Notebook. Make sure you're logged into your Google account. So let's run the first cell and get the codes from the GitHub site. Import the relevant libraries. And now here are the settings. So it's seed governs the random numbers. Width and height are the width and height of the maze. And it can be between three and eight for each. And n episodes is the number of trips from start to end that are taken during the Q-learning algorithm. So let's run this. And let's create the model. And let's do the simulation and let's plot the results. So this plot shows the episode number and the number of steps from start to end. So initially, in the first episode, the first trip through the maze, it took 200 and close to 250 steps to go from start to end. And as we take more and more episodes or more and more trips through the maze, the Q-learning algorithm learns um, a more optimal strategy and you can see there are fewer and fewer steps that are required to go from start to end. And finally, it settles down at this value of 16, which is the minimal number of steps to go from start to end. Okay. And now here's the animation of the strategy. So it'll take a second to create the animation. So initially, remember, we assume that in each square, we can go in any of the four directions uh, with equal probability. And let's run this. Let's stop here. So this is episode 11. That means we have gone through the maze 11 times from start to end. And this is what we have learned over those 11 um, trips through the maze. So you can see that the optimal strategy is found for this channel. But in these squares here, we're still not don't have the optimal strategy. So additional learning is required to um, determine the optimal strategy. So let's continue. And now you can see it settling down and finding the optimal strategy. And now we have the optimal strategy. Okay. And um, so what are the things you want to do, um, the experiments you want to try? So one thing we can try right away is let's try a different random number. So let's rerun this. Let's create the model, simulate. Remember this plot, and now with a different random number, we'll have a different plot. So you can see here, now in the first um, episode, it took roughly 130 or so steps to go from start to end. It increased, and again, it's decreasing, and then finally settles down. And if we run the animation, we should see something similar to what we saw before. And again, we find the optimal strategy here after maybe 10 or 12 episodes, and then the optimal strategy throughout this maze. Okay. So again, you want you may want to experiment with these codes. Try changing the width and height. And if you increase the size of the maze, you might need to increase the number of episodes. So this is the number of times we go through the maze to learn the optimal strategy. With a larger maze, you might need more episodes to ultimately get the optimal strategy. So I'll let you play around with this code. Thanks, and that ends this lecture. Remember, you can save um, this notebook in your Google Drive, and let's go to runtime and manage sessions and terminate. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to chapter 5.9, demo of running codes on a local machine using the Anaconda platform. So you can download course resources zip file from the GitHub site and unzip to your local machine. I have a Windows 10 machine. I've unzipped the, to the folder what is ML dash master 
and I have put this folder in the same folder as documents. Okay, so we'll do a demo of this um, in a couple of minutes. In terms of the Anaconda platform, it's a distribution of Python for scientific computing. You can get a free individual edition at the Anaconda website, and we will look at that in a minute. There are plenty of online tutorials for installing and using Anaconda. And the Anaconda platform has all the necessary packages needed to run course codes right out of the box. Okay. In terms of running notebooks in Jupyter Notebook locally, this is similar to Google Colab, but on your local machine. We open up Jupyter Notebooks. This should open up a browser on your machine, and then we can run um, the notebooks in the supervised folder, the unsupervised folder, or the reinforcement folder. These notebooks are exactly the same as those used in Google Colab demos. And as an example, um, later in this um, lecture, we will run the supervised classification binary notebook. Okay. And then finally, we can run Python codes in the Anaconda prompt window. So we will open up an Anaconda prompt window, and the Anaconda prompt is similar to a command window in Windows. And then we can run drivers in the supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement folder. These drivers are analogous to the Google Colab notebooks we saw previously. And as an example command, we run Python and then the name of the driver. So we will do a demo of that as we go through this lecture. So let's get out of PowerPoint and go to first, let's go to the course GitHub site. So this is the GitHub site and we can click on code here and then download the zip file. So I've already done that and unzipped on my machine. So here is my machine. This is the same folder as where the documents folder is located. And here's my what is ML dash master. It has the code presentation and resources. And then for the code, we have the data for the MNIST. And then we have the reinforcement supervised and unsupervised folders. Okay. In terms of Anaconda, this is the Anaconda website. And you can read more about Anaconda here. For products, go to the individual edition. And then if we go down below here, we will get to the installers. And you can pick the installer that's appropriate for your machine. Okay. So I've, um, I got the 64 bit uh, graphical installer for Windows for my machine. Okay. So you can um, go through the installa installation process and get Anaconda on your machine. So once you have Anaconda on your machine, um, how do we get a Jupyter Notebook? So I'm going to type in Jupyter. So go to Jupyter Notebook and the Anaconda 3 version. So let me click this. This will open up a browser. And now this is the folder where my document is located. And this is the what is ML master. So let me click this. Go to code. Go to supervised. And let's look at this first notebook, the binary classification example. So if we click this, this is the binary classification demo, similar to what we saw in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, just to be on the safe side, I just want to point out, you should be in Python 3. This is the environment. And if you need to change the environment, you should go to kernel, change kernel, and go to Python 3. I have some other environments for um, other uh, codes. So you want to be in the Python 3 environment. Okay, so then um, we can just run each of these cells as we did in Google Colab. We don't need to run this first cell, but we can start by importing the libraries. So we can go to run. And now this is the settings. So I'm not gonna go through the settings again. You can go to the binary classification um, Google Colab demo, but let's just run this. set up the data. And we saw this picture previously when we did the Google Colab demo. We can define the model. Here's a four layer neural network. 
and we specify the loss function and optimization routine. Here we perform the learning and we're taking 100 iterations, so 100 steps by the optimization routine to try to minimize the loss function. And you can see the similar accuracy that we saw in Google Colab 0.987. Now we can plot the results. Here's a plot of the um, loss function. Click run again. Now we're going to plot the uh, results at the final iteration. So you can see we saw this plot previously, and then we can generate the animation. So it'll take a few seconds. So now we have the animation. It's the same player that we saw in Google Colab, and we can run this, and it runs in a loop here. So this will repeat. Okay, so I just wanted to show how to run a notebook locally on your machine. So you get the Jupyter Notebooks, make sure you're in the correct environment here, and then go to each cell and then click the Run button to run each cell. We don't need to run this first cell. Okay, so the next thing I want to show is um, running things in the Anaconda prompt window. So if you go to Anaconda, so let's open up an Anaconda prompt window. And now this is the same directory. It opens up to the same directory where the documents folder is located. So here's my what is ML master folder. And if I go to what is ML master and I go to code and I go to supervise, um, here are the, the programs in that folder. I'm gonna run the binary classification driver. The other thing I want to point out is that you can bring up this folder in an editor. So I have a Sublime editor on my machine. So I'm in the what is ML master code supervised and I've brought up the binary classification driver here. So here is that driver. And if I want to run the program, I can go Python and then the name of the program and we can run that. So we get the 0.987 um, accuracy that we saw previously in the notebook, and then here are the plot. So here's the loss function. Here's the initial training data. And now here's the animation that's going to be looping, so it keeps repeating. So um, now it's coming to a near the end, and then it's going to repeat. So we start again, and it repeats. So this is exactly the same animation that we saw in the Google Colab demo and in the um, Jupyter Notebook demo. Just when we go back to Jupyter Notebooks, um, you can go to File and you can Save and Checkpoint. So that saves what you have done um, and the latest sort of settings in this Jupyter Notebook. So when you bring it up again, you'll have those latest settings. Okay. So um, I'll let you, if you decide to um, download um, Anaconda and download the codes to your machine. You can follow this lecture to just get started. There are, there are lots of videos on um, running Anaconda on your machine and um, you can use various editors. And here all the codes are available. So you can look at the, the neural network code. You can look at the plotting programs. So you can look at all those codes um, if you like. So I'll leave that up to you. So that ends this lecture and thanks and we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello and welcome back to the course What is Machine Learning? This is chapter six, concluding remarks and useful resources. What was covered in this course? This course has given an overview of machine learning algorithms and the types of problems that can be solved. Remember, there are three broad areas of machine learning. Supervised learning, here one fits a function to data and then uses it for prediction. There's unsupervised learning, one finds patterns in data. And then reinforcement learning, where one finds um, strategies to maximize cumulative reward. The common theme that we have seen in the various algorithms um, that we've talked about uh, is that these algorithms are iterative. We make an initial guess for the function, pattern, or strategy, and then improve it. Okay, 
So there are various areas of under, uh, mathematics underlying machine learning. For example, linear algebra in supervised learning, matrix multiplication is a key part of the neural network approach. And in unsupervised learning, one uses the singular value decomposition for PCA. Um, in the field of probability and statistics, in re reinforcement learning, um, we saw we uh, tracking sample means for the K-banded problem. And also in reinforcement learning, um, the Markov process is used for the underlying model for um, the maze example, for example. Um, in the field of simulation, in reinforcement learning, we simulated episodes for the Q-learning algorithm. And we've talked about optimization in supervised learning, where it's used to minimize the loss function using the gradient descent or atom algorithms, for example. And then multivariable calculus is used in supervised learning to compute derivatives to be used in optimization algorithms. So these are some of the areas of math um, that we touched upon in the examples that we presented in this course. And there are many other areas that um, show up. Okay. So in terms of learning material, um, one can search the internet for articles and book references based on the terms mentioned in this course. For supervised learning, we mentioned linear regression, classification, neural networks, gradient descent, atom. Uh, these are a few of the terms that we mentioned. For unsupervised learning, there's hierarchical clustering, k-means, PCA. For reinforcement learning, we talked about the k-banded problem, explore versus exploit, and q-learning. There are many informative machine learning communities, such as Medium, Towards Data Science, Machine Learning Mastery, and Analytics Vidya. So for each of these communities, they have a collection of blogs and articles of related to machine learning. Finally, there are online courses, many courses at Coursera and Udemy and other outlets. Okay. In terms of codes, let's talk about a machine learning framework. So it's an interface library or tool which allows one to build machine learning models without needing to know all the details of the underlying algorithms. So you can look at this link at uridica.com for a reference, and I've made that link available in the what is ML um, resources file. Um, there are many publicly available machine learning frameworks. A good starting point is scikit-learn. So this has functions for supervised and unsupervised learning in Python, and you can do learning and prediction in a few lines of code. There are many other frameworks that have low-level routines for building neural networks and doing learning, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Cafe. And you can look at this Wikipedia page for a comparison of various deep learning software. Um, advantage of uh, many of these is they run on a GPU, which can be much, much faster than a CPU. A GPU is a graphical processing unit. Okay. There are specialized frameworks for reinforcement learning, such as Keras RL, Dopamine, TensorForce, and OpenAI. Okay. In terms of data, there's a website called Kaggle, and this is a site for data science competitions, often with prize money. So each competition comes with freely available data, and you can learn from tutorials, practice competitions, and notebooks created by other participants. So participants seem to be um, quite eager to share their work uh, often after the competitions are over and for some of the practice competitions. So most, most codes are in Python um, and it's a very good site for, for data to um, um, test your algorithms and um, check out various things. So there's also the University of California Irvine Machine Learning Data Repository. So here's the link and it contains hundreds of machine learning data sets. Um, typically for supervised learning. Okay. In terms of the um, resources, so I've listed all the resources in the um, resources uh, file uh, that's part of this course. It's in the what is ML resources, uh, what is ML underscore resources PDF file. So I've al already mentioned this file in the introductory chapter, so you can go to this file and it's a link to this section and it has a whole bunch of links to resources and organized by chapter. Finally, um, I have a machine learning um, proposal for learning. So the first thing is, if you're new to this field, um, you should learn a programming language if you um, don't already know uh, a language. So Python is the most popular, but others used include R, Java, JavaScript, C++, and so on. 
there are a lot of lo online courses to learn these languages. Second, um, I suggest taking a course. So if new to machine learning, you might start with a course. Um, if that's not your cup of tea um, and you want to do things more on your own, so you can go to many of those machine learning communities or go to just um, typing some terms um, and searching for information about um, those terms as suggested previously. But um, it may be best to take a course which has sort of a curated uh, collection of information and um, it will guide you to um, the material. And finally, I suggest writing code yourself. Start with a machine learning framework, and then, but to truly understand what is going on, you need to program algorithms yourself, such as neural networks, k-means, PCA, um, the Bandit, and Q-learning, and the other examples we've looked at in this um, course. Okay, so finally, I wanna say thank you. Thank you for taking this course. I hope that it has been a worthwhile experience and that it has increased your interest in machine learning. Best and finally, best wishes for your future learning and endeavors. So thanks and um, best wishes. Hello, and welcome back to the course, What is Machine Learning? We're moving on to chapter seven. This is an optional bonus lecture. I wanna draw your attention to additional machine learning courses. The first is entitled Introduction to Machine Learning, and it's a supervised machine learning course on Udemy. I am the instructor, and the course covers material that we saw in chapter two of this course. Specifically, it covers linear and logistic regression and neural networks, including the underlying math, development of a framework in Python, and applications. The second course is entitled Unsupervised Machine Learning with Python, and it's an unsupervised machine learning course on Udemy. I am the instructor, and this course covers the material we saw in chapter three of this course. Specifically, it covers clustering and dimension reduction algorithms, including the underlying math, Python implementation, and applications. So have a look at these courses if you're interested. I've made links to these courses available in the resources tab for this section, or you can search on my name, Satish Reddy. Thanks and happy learning.